we're going to be discussing the structure of prophecy. Like we looked at in the previous lectures, prophecy is very, very important. In the Bible, prophecy has been given to us for a number of reasons, which I'll get into in a couple of minutes. But prophecy is possibly the most powerful, but the most misunderstood aspect of the Word of God. God has sealed up His truths in prophetic language. And He's done so that only diligent study is able to unlock it. More and more as we enter the final times of the world, those that are truly diligent about the word of God are the ones that are able to unlock and explain prophecy. The reason God locked prophecy in prophetic language is so that he could protect it from corruption from outside fingers as it were from people that would influence the bible and prophecy to mean something else so that satan once he understood prophecy would adjust it but because it's locked up in prophetic language it can only be encoded and decoded by the bible the only way to unlock or decode prophecy is to learn the language of prophecy from the bible and apply that language to the information so you've, you get a type of prophetic stencil, which when you look at the prophecy through the stencil, it makes sense. Prophecy was given to us, as it explains in Amos 3 verse 7, to give us security in our knowledge about what's coming in future. Amos 3 verse 7 explains, it says, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but He revealeth His secret, unto his servants the prophets so the prophets in a sense have got a very very important task it's the way of being able to help israel or help the people of god i not only identify where they are in the stream of time but cope with that which is lying in wait for them so the lord will allow nothing to take place until he has revealed it to his prophets one of the aspects we're going to be looking at later on in this lecture series is prophecy itself. Right at the end, we'll be looking at the gift of prophecy. Before that, we'll be looking at false prophecy and how false prophecy has filtered in today where almost everyone can prophesy or be some sort of a prophet. But biblical prophecy is different. It has been given to us for five reasons. Number one, it's been given to us to prove that Jesus is God. We did that in the lecture, Who is God? Number two, it proves that the Bible is divinely inspired. This is one of the biggest arguments and attacks on the word about man wrote the Bible. Well, prophecy is able to defend that and show that the Bible is truly divinely inspired. Through prophecy, we can also identify where we are in the stream of time, how far we are, how close we are, etc., etc., it's also able to assist mankind to escape deception. You see, when the disciples came to Jesus and they asked him, Lord, tell us what must we look for? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? Jesus said, be careful that no man deceive you. Prophecy helps us make sure that we are not trapped by satanic deception. And then lastly, it gives us the confidence that even though when we look around us at the confusion in the world, and boy, there's a lot more coming, when we look at that, we often think, well, where's God? Well, prophecy gives us the confidence that even though it might not seem like it, God actually is always in control. Now, Satan is a created being. He, is, 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 he was a, an angel, a fallen angel that fell out of heaven in the, in the war between God and God and the dragon between Michael and the dragon. And this created being, because he's a created being like you and I, does not have the ability to see into the future. This is a very important topic, a very important point, right? We've just shown how God, who lives outside of the timeline, can see past, present, and future at the same time. That's why he's God. But anybody, including the angels, the fallen angels, 
all live inside the timeline along with us. So they can't see just like I and you can't see into the future, neither can Satan. And funny enough, just as we have to, Satan has to study the same prophecies as we have to, to understand what's going to happen in future. From here on, the lectures are going to become more and more graphic about the deceptions and the, the, the traps that Satan has got planned for us. But I'd like to give you a hint of what's coming down the line. So in order to understand biblical prophecy, we're going to look inside the Bible, but then I'm going to show you the contrast from extra-biblical sources. This is a book written by a gentleman by the name of Roger Morneau, who was at a time a demon worshipper. Those are people that worship the fallen angels, which I was also involved in. I wasn't involved in the worship of them as much as such. But this is a gentleman who got involved with satanic occult practices of demon worship at the highest levels. Not only was he involved with them, he was involved with people who was who were communicating directly with Satan himself. In other words, the satanic high priest would be in communication with Satan and would have certain discussions. When Roger Morneau turned around and became a Christian, he wrote a book, and in there he wrote down what had been said at these satanic discussions. This that I'm going to read to you now is a demon worshiper in communication and conversation with a satanic high priest. In the book, A Trip into the Supernatural. At the beginning of the 18th century, he said, this is now the satanic high priest, said that Satan and his spirit counselors held a great general council to prepare for the industrial age that would soon break upon the world. Satan foresaw that an age of scientific discovery and intellectual enlightenment would immediately follow upon its heels. It would usher in the end times. The close of the struggle between the forces of good and evil. Now listen to this. Since Satan had been studying the prophecies of the Bible, he understood the meaning of Daniel 12 verse 4 that described the time of the end, how many shall run to and fro, and how knowledge would be increased. This is a satanic high priest. Let me remind you, this is a satanic high priest saying that his boss, Lucifer, or now Satan, has to study the Bible to see into the future. Wonderful, wonderful knowledge. We've got the same ability to defend ourselves as what he has to deceive us. The satanic priest continues and he says, After lengthy deliberations, this is now at the satanic general council where Satan pulled all his generals and all his fallen angels together, after lengthy deliberations, he said, returning to the subject of Satan's general council, the council closed after having produced plans for deceptions that would disqualify vast numbers of people from Christ's kingdom. They would then automatically become part of Satan's kingdom. This planned course of action would require all demon spirits to carefully counsel humans to live in a way that would disqualify themselves from becoming members of Christ's kingdom. Now listen to this. Satanic high priest says, the spirits, these are demons, fallen angels, would encourage people to listen to their feelings instead of the word of Christ and his prophets. In no sure way could the spirits obtain control of people's lives without the individuals realizing what is happening. The spirits would suggest all kinds of erroneous doctrines and ideas and humanity would readily accept them. Why? Because they felt strongly about them. Satan, as in the Garden of Eden, where Eve saw that the food was good for food and was, would make her wise, once she was deceived by the feelings, he had her. Now, as regarding the end time, Satan understands that there's a time coming. He's going to develop certain mechanisms by which he can mislead people by following their feelings rather than the prophets of Christ. This is the reason why the Lord has given us prophecy so that we do not get deceived. Sadly today, most Christians' understanding of the Bible is very limited. And they rely on their feelings in, in coordination with the experiences that they have to identify and to recognize God. And specifically to determine their relationship with God. 
Very, very, very few Christians today are able to say in defense of their faith, no, 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 it is written so and so and so and so. Today, Christianity and the closeness and the relationship that we have to God is all too often determined by the feelings that we have, which, as we've just read, is the fulfillment of satanic prophecy, which is what his plan is. Now, God gives us prophecy, prophecy to guide us away from Satan's deceptions, but Satan is bargaining, us on, uh, bargaining on us not putting in the time to study these prophecies. He makes our lives busier and busier and busier, that we don't have the time to, to spend the time or the effort to delve into these things with diligent study. And therefore, Satan closes the door on us and our ability to defend ourselves. And that's why I'm doing this entire lecture, the structure of prophecy, that you can look into the system of the Bible, the systematic structure of the Bible, and can have your faith strengthened to understand that God is truly in control. It is also said, oh, the Bible is very difficult to understand. It contradicts itself, etc., etc., etc. But it's beautifully stated in 2 Corinthians 11 verse 3. But I fear, lest by any means as the serpent deceived or beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. From the what? From the simplicity that is in Christ. Just as the Old Testament in its simplicity is fulfilled in the New Testament, today we can fulfill our understanding from the simplicity that is in Christ and more specifically the prophecies in the Bible and in the revelation of Jesus Christ. So let's look into this, this topic of prophecy. Prophecy is a very, very serious matter and Revelation ends off with a very stern warning. Read it in your own Bibles. Revelation 22 verses 18 to 19. It states the following. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. That's a very, very serious warning. Fiddle with this and you're in trouble. Today, and we'll be looking at this in a later lecture. Tw Revelation 22.14 in the New Bible is completely different to Revelation 22.14 in the older Bibles. That's just a hint for coming up lectures. Now Revelation often it today is called a sealed book. You're not supposed to understand it. It's difficult. It's got beasts and dragons and all types of things in it. We're not supposed to understand it. Well, the word revelation means to reveal. Revelation is not meant to be a sealed book. It's meant to reveal what's coming in future. Revelation 1 verse 3, this is the third verse of the very first chapter, says, Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of the prophecy and keep the things that are written therein. That's simple. Don't think it's a closed book. Blessed are ye that hear, that read, that understand and keep the, written, the writings that are written. Wonderful. Now, in order to understand how prophecy is, is structured in these books, we need to look at a couple of basic concepts, right? We're going to look at interpretation of symbols. We're going to look at chiastic structure of writing, etc., etc. Let's just start off for the moment with symbols and how to interpret symbols. Symbols in prophecy are a critical element because like it says in 2 Peter 1 verse 20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, it's important to understand that when in prophetic language God is speaking about beasts and dragons and wars or, or seas and winds, we cannot take that and interpret it according to our life at the moment. Because like, just like with Benny Hinn, nuclear bombs today wouldn't have made sense 100 years ago. Wouldn't have made sense 2,000 years ago. So we've got to ask the, the Bible what the Bible means when it says certain things. Symbols are also the chastity belt of prophecy. They allow prophecy to remain pure and uncorrupted 
for the period of time until Jesus comes to fetch his own. Now the interpretation of prophecy can be split into two categories pretty much. Easy and difficult. Let's look at an easy example. Three text words, Revelation 12 verse 13, Revelation 12 verse 17, and Revelation 13 verse 4. Revelation 12 verse 13, the dragon persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. Right, so here we have our first representation or indication of a dragon. Now who is this dragon? Well, 12 17 says that the dragon went forth to make war with the remnant of her seed. Verse 30, or chapter 13, verse 4 says, The dragon that gave power unto the beast. So there's this dragon, dragon, dragon. Who is this dragon? Well, in the easy category, it's quite simple to find out because you ask the Bible to tell you who the dragon is. I can't tell you it's such a character from the Lord of the Rings or it's such a character from this movie because it wouldn't make sense. We've got to go into the Bible and say, Excuse me, Mr. Bible, please could you tell me who's the dragon in Revelation 13, verse 4? Revelation 12 verse 9 says the following. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. You see, it's actually really simple. If you allow the Bible to unlock the Bible, when you speak about dragons and this and that, the Bible will tell you who the dragon is. It is the devil and Satan. Let's go to a little bit of a more difficult example. Let's look at wings found in Daniel 7. Daniel 7 verse 6. After this I beheld and lo another like a leopard which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl and also four heads and dominion was given to it. Here is a, some sort of an animal or a beast. It was similar to a leopard but on the back it had four wings of a fowl. Now I can't tell you what four wings of a fowl means or are there four wings of a fowl? How does it work? So we will have to look at the Bible and say, excuse me Bible, please could you tell me what wings are? Well it's obviously that the wings are important but even when you read through the rest of Daniel you don't quite understand what wings might mean. So if you can't find it in the same book like we did in Revelation with the dragon, like we can't find it in Daniel, we look outside Daniel for more answers. Ezekiel 1 verse 9 says, Their wings were joined one to another. They turned not when they went, they went everyone straight forward. Now this sounds a bit weird. Let me read that again. Their wings were joined one to another. They turned not when they went. They went, every one of them, straight forward. Okay? So in Ezekiel, in this example in Ezekiel verse, uh, chapter 1 verse 9, wings describe a type of determination or motion as if nothing can stop it. There's some momentum. They went straight forward. They didn't bend at all. Let's have a look at another example. Ezekiel 1 verse 24. And when they went... I heard the noise of their wings. When they stood, they let down their wings. So that's got to do with motion and motionless. When they stood, they let down their wings. And when they went, their wings were moving. Right? Try Ezekiel 10 verse 16. And when the cherubims lifted up their wings to mount up from the earth. It's a very powerful thing to mount up from the earth. So the cherubims, who are the, the angels, they lifted their wings to mount up from the earth. It's got to do with, again, movement. It's got to do with uh, power. It's got to do with strength. There's some indication here about movement, power, strength, etc., etc. Let's try one more. Ezekiel 10 verse 19. And the cherubims lifted up their wings and mounted up from the earth in my sight when they went out. Again, another element of the whole wings story it's got to do with motion so it appears when we're reading in ezekiel which is just one book when we're reading in ezekiel it symbolizes the wings symbolize determination action momentum movement etc etc now looking again outside of that into isaiah and job we see the same word which is, is in the Strong's Concordance tells you that the, the word in Hebrew is something like kornof, kornof, the word for wings. That's the word which they've translated into wings. 
has been translated into a different English word. So even though they're using wings as kornof in Ezekiel, when you get to Isaiah and Job, the word kornof in Hebrew has been translated into different words. It's been translated into uh, a, a, an edge or an extremity, specifically of an army. Interesting. Or a wing of a bird or a garment, a, a flap of clothing etc etc it's got to do with outskirts it's got to do with extremities so it could also have something to do with armies so you start to when you do a theme study of the bible and you look for kornof the word for wings in daniel and ezekiel starts to make sense let's look at isaiah eleven twelve. and he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall in assemble the outcasts of israel and gather together the dispersed of judah from the four corners of the earth the word corners is the original hebrew kornof so when you're looking at corners can you imagine it was translated into wings it wouldn't make sense and gathered together the dispersed of judah from the four wings of the earth so it's corners it's got to do with distance it's got to do with stretching it's got to do with motion and and size etc let's try another one job 37 verse 3 he directed it under the whole heaven and his lightning unto the cornorf of the earth, unto the ends of the earth. Let's try Job 38 verse 13. That it might take hold of the cornorf of the earth, the ends of the earth, that the wicked might be shaken out of it. You see, now you start to put this puzzle together. This is why prophecy takes diligent study. It's not something that we can just read and say, oh, it must mean the following. No, it takes diligent study. It takes understanding what the original wording means. And that's not rocket science today. You just go to any religious bookstore, get yourself a concordance of the Bible. All the original words are in there and all the translations, and you can do the study yourself. If you're really interested in prophecy, this will be an easy study for you. Now, I'm going to get into this a little bit later, but... The wings, as denoted in Daniel 7 verse 6, indicate power, strength, movement, motion, uh, momentum, the ends of the earth, extremities, etc., etc. And when we look at Daniel 7 verse 6 with the leopard with the four wings, we'll see just now that the kingdom that is represented by that leopard with wings went further south and further east than any of the previous kingdoms. It's a representation of the, the speed at which this kingdom expanded. So now we start to see how the Bible unlocks the Bible when it comes to prophecy. This is the chastity belt of the Word of God. So now we can look at all of these, all of these specific uh, examples that we've given from Isaiah and Ezekiel and Job. And we can see that when we look at the, the kingdom in Daniel 7 verse 6, we can see that our deduction was in fact correct. Wings appear to symbolize speed and determination. And this is the type of study we'll have to do. We will always have to check whether scripture is aligned with scripture before we make any conclusions. That way we always ensure that the Lord is guiding us through our understanding. That no personal influence about our current understanding of the world comes in when we're trying to understand the Word of God. Now this manner of interpretation goes a very long way in assisting us to understand the books of prophecy. But it, it takes a while and it leads and lends itself to diligent study. So those are symbols. That's the one aspect that we're going to look at. What about recapitulation? Recapitulation is just a big word to mean to repeat itself every time, adding on more information. It's like when you're studying for your exam, you recap your work. You go through it one more time, hoping that something else will be absorbed. Well, this is exactly the same as what happens in the Bible with prophecy. The Lord gives us an example, and then He gives us the, different, the same example, but in a different way, adding a little bit of information each time so that it can enhance our understanding. So let's look at Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2 is a description in the Bible about a king that is having a dream. He's having a, a dream that disturbs him and he wakes up in the morning and he's very confused because this, this dream has stirred up his spirit somehow. And King Nebuchadnezzar, 
He says in Daniel 2 verse 3, I have had a dream and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. Now the Chaldeans and the soothsayers and all the wise men of, of his kingdom come to him and say, O oh, king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream and we will give the interpretation. King Nebuchadnezzar, however, says, My decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me and its interpretation, you shall be cut to pieces and your houses shall be made an ash heap. Wow. The king can't remember what he's dreamt. But he knows that it's disturbed him. So he calls in his soothsayers and he says, Come here, uh, tell me what I dreamt and tell me the meaning. Otherwise you're going to be cut to pieces and your houses will be burnt. However, he says in Daniel 2 verse 6, If you tell me the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive gifts from me, rewards and great honor. Therefore, tell me the dream and its interpretation. So there's a reward. Daniel 2 verse 10 says, The Chaldeans answered and said, King, there is not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. Therefore, no king, lord or ruler has ever asked such a thing of any magician, astrologer or Chaldean. There is no other who can tell it to the king except the gods who dwelling, whose dwelling is not with flesh. I agree with them. You see, if you exist inside the timeline, you cannot determine the dream or what it means. You have to be influenced by somebody that lives outside the timeline that can look back into the timeline, bring that information out and give it to you to say, right, this is what he dreamt. So you have to be associated to a God that is living outside of the timeline. So these soothsayers and these Chaldeans and all these magicians, they are dealing with gods that live inside the timeline. This is why prophecy is so important. So King Nebuchadnezzar sends out the, dis the decree, execute them, kill them all. Daniel, however, hears about this because he's also one of the wise men of the kingdom. And he says, hold on a second. Let me see if my God can help bring this dream to light. So he prays to the Lord and the Lord gives him a dream. But the Lord allows Daniel to remember the dream. Then in Daniel 2 verse 24, he says, Daniel says, do not execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king and I will interpret his dream for him. And Daniel is then put in front of the king and he starts to explain to the king what he actually dreamt. Daniel 2 verse 27. The secret which the king has demanded the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. Well, they can't because their God lives out inside the timeline. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. You see, here's another representation of a vision about the end time. Daniel starts to explain to King Nebuchadnezzar the goings on in his dream. He says in Daniel 2 verse 29, As for you, O king, Thoughts came to your mind while on your bed about what would come to pass after this. And he who revealed secrets has made known to you what will be. You, O king, were watching and behold a great image. This great image whose splendor was excellent stood before you and its form was awesome. The image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched as a stone was cut out without hands, which means uh, by a supernatural power, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them into pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze and the silver and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. See, Daniel, in one or two sentences, is able to put the entire dream down in front of King Nebuchadnezzar. And he explains to the king about this magnificent image that he's seen with the head of gold and the chest and arms of silver, the legs of bronze and the, the hips of bronze and the legs of iron and the feet of iron and clay. What has actually happened here is that God has given both to King Nebuchadnezzar and to Daniel an indication of what's going to take place from then, which was 606 before Christ, into eternity. He's showing the kingdom 
oh, or he's showing the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, what is going to take place after his kingdom and then after that and then after that into the future. So Daniel starts to expand. He says, you, O king, in Daniel 2 verse 38, you are this head of gold. Well, that's a wonderful thing because King Nebuchadnezzar knows that his kingdom is the most powerful, wealthiest kingdom in the world. And he says in Daniel 2 verse 39, Daniel says, But after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours. Now this is a major blow to King Nebuchadnezzar. He says in Daniel 4 verse 30, The king spoke saying, Is this not great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by, by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? Isn't this going to last forever? I'm of the opinion as the king that my kingdom will never fall will never ever fall daniel's saying well the lord's telling me it will because after you is going to come a kingdom inferior you are gold the kingdom of gold but there will be a kingdom that will have two parts the arms of silver that will be inferior to your kingdom basically what he was hinting to there is king belshazzar let's just pop quickly to daniel 5 king belshazzar is having a, a party with his woman and his wine and they're drinking and having merry. And out of the blue, a hand starts to write on the wall. Remember the writing on the wall, the st saying that we have, the writings on the wall? Same now, same takes place. The king Belshazzar is having this party and the hand starts to write on the wall. Daniel 5 verse 5 says, The king watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale and he was so frightened that his knees knocked together and his legs gave way. So this hand starts to write on the wall and what does it write? Mene, mene, tekel, perez. What that means is God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom has been divided. Now listen carefully. Your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Interesting. So from then onwards, from King Belshazzar's time onwards, the head of gold would stop and the two elements, the chest of silver, would take over. So Daniel is pointing to a time in the future, explained in Daniel 5, of the Medes and the Persians taking over from the head of gold. So if you look into history, you'll see that from about 539 BC till about 331 BC was the time of the Medes and the Persians. The Medes and the Persians being two separate entities, the one always being slightly stronger than the other one, the one raised up on the one side. Daniel 2 verse 39 says, you're the head of gold, then comes the chest of, of silver. Daniel 2 39. Next, a third kingdom. One of bronze will rule over the whole earth. Very interesting. This is a prophecy about a third kingdom that's going to come after the king of Babylon. And if we look outside the Bible, pure history, we read the book, the, it's called the Historical Library, uh, book 17, chapter 12 by Arian. He says, I am persuaded that there was no nation, city, nor people where his name did not reach. There seems to, uh, to me to have been some divine hand presiding both over his birth and actions. What he's referring to here is the king of Greece. This is King Alexander the Great, the first king of Greece. He started in the west and with startling speed he conquered nation after nation after nation going east and south. This is the, the representation of the leopard with the wings, which we'll get into just now. Within 10 years, this king, Alexander the Great, had conquered the world, the known world at that time. At the age of 32, he broke into tears. He burst into tears because he had no one else that he could conquer. And he died at a very young age. And Greece was then ruled by the four most influential generals of Alexander's army. A perfect fulfillment of prophecy. From the history of Rome, book 3, chapter 10, it is written, On June 22nd, 168 BC, at the Battle of Pydna, perished the empire of Alexander the Great, 140 years after his death. The empire of Alexander the Great came to an end 
140 years after his death, exactly as prophesied when this would happen. Daniel 2 verse 40, And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron. This has got to do with Rome. And I'll show you now why. But this kingdom will be as strong as iron. Just for interest sake, if you look into history, and you look at the weaponry, the outfits, the armor of Greece, you'll see that it was mostly bronze. And if you look at the armor of Rome, you'll see that it was interestingly mostly iron. These are two images from that time, one from Greece, one from Rome, depicting the layout of their defenses. The legs of iron which proceed from the hips of Greece or the hips of bronze, King Alexander the Great, are the legs of Rome from approximately 168 BC to 476 AD, a very long period in time, a very, very powerful kingdom. Let's look for a moment again outside the Bible and check whether extra biblical information supports what the Bible says. Edward Gibbon, who's uh, a normal historian, he writes in the book The History and Decline of the Fall of the Roman Empire, he says, the images of gold or silver or brass that might serve to represent the nations and their kings were successively broken by the iron monarchy of Rome. History supporting Daniel in the word of God. Second century, this is approximately 100 years after the birth of Christ, 100 to 200 years after the birth of Christ, Hippolytus, who's one of the anti nicene fathers, wrote the following that was written on volume 5, page 210. Rejoice, blessed Daniel, thou hast not been in error. Already the iron rules. So in his time, Hippolytus, in his time, he can see that iron is ruling. And he can see that the fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy of the legs of iron had come to fruition. Fantastic how you can identify where you are in the stream of time. And the Roman kingdom continued from about 168 BC to 476 AD. Very powerful kingdom, very scary kingdom. A lot of things that took place, which we'll get into in later lectures, but quite phenomenal to see how the Lord identified what was going to happen in future. Daniel 2 verse 41 continues. We're not at the bottom of the statue yet. Remember, you've got the head of gold, the chest of silver, head of gold, Babylon, chest of silver, the Medes and the Persians, the hips of gold, which was Greece through Alexander the Great, the legs of Rome, and now into the feet. Daniel 2.41, just as you saw that the feet and toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom. So after the legs of Rome are finished, will come a divided kingdom. Now, question. What has the kingdom of Rome, if you look at the map, what has the kingdom of Rome, that area, developed into today? Well, it's Europe, right? In Rome at the time, there were ten kingdoms. You had the Anglo-Saxons, you had the Franks, the Alemanni, the Lombards, the Ostrogoths, the Heruli, the Burgundies, the Vandals, the Visigoths, Visigoths and the Suevi. Those were the ten kingdoms. Those are the ten toes of the statue. Incredible. Just like Rome, its two legs would break up into ten toes and be divided, the Roman kingdom had the same thing. There would be the power of Rome that would split up into ten sub-kingdoms. Perfect fulfillment of biblical prophecy. And today, if we take this a little bit further, where are we today? We are today looking if at, at the map, you'll see a divided Europe. Because the Bible said in Daniel 2.42, and so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another just as iron does not mix with clay. This is one of the most powerful quotations in the Bible. In the King James Version, the words used are, they shall not cleave. Throughout history, Man has been trying to unify these separated kingdoms. But the word of God has said it will not happen. Forever, those kingdoms will remain separated. And that some will be strong and some will be weak. And today, you look at exactly the same thing. Daniel 2 verse 43. And more than iron mixes with clay, the one will be strong and the one will be weak. 
So throughout history, we can see that this has happened where even using bloodlines, they've tried to combine and unify Europe. You've got to just look into history. You'll see Queen Diana and King Frederick using their bloodlines of the monarchs to try and get the monarchs to uh, get together. But Daniel 2, 42, 43, I want to read it one more time. So the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. They shall mingle themselves with the seeds of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. Just look at the map of Europe and tell me, is it a united Europe in one country? Or are we seeing a fulfillment of prophecy according to Daniel? Guess what? Even today, they're still trying to unify Europe through the European Union. And we'll get into that in the lecture much later on in the series called A New World Order. Napoleon said in The Watchman in 1941, it was written that Napoleon said, I wanted to found a European system, a European code of laws, a European court of appeals. There would have been one people throughout Europe. Europe would soon have become one nation. This was Napoleon's goal. He wanted Europe to unify and to have basically what we now today see as the European Union, where the borders would be dropped and this divided kingdom would come together. 30 years after Waterloo, Dr. Thomas Arnold said, the deliverance of Europe from the dominion of Napoleon was affected neither by Russia, nor by Germany, nor by England, but how? By the hand of God. What happened to stop Napoleon? Can you remember? It was the weather. He, didn't, he wasn't stopped by any country. He wasn't blocked by any national force. What happened with Hitler? Hitler said the same thing with his forces, his Reich walking all over, the, all over stomping all over Germany and putting up these the big symbols of the, the sun god Ra, which was his symbol, the swastika with the eagles with his arms outstretched. He said, he, he, he once wrote that he will build a kingdom that will rule for a thousand years. In Paris, he even went to the grave of Napoleon. And at the grave, he said, Napoleon, you were a fool. I will succeed where you have failed. Hitler was ready to make his final strike. Right? Remember, across the English Channel. And on the morning that he was to attack, what happened? A thick mist engulfed the area and the Allied forces had time to escape. A fulfillment of prophecy? Why doesn't he just read what it says in Daniel? They shall not cleave. Charlemagne tried to unify Europe and was defeated. Charles V tried and he was defeated. Louis XIV was defeated trying to do it. Napoleon tried and was defeated. Kaiser Wilhelm tried and he was defeated. Hitler tried and he was defeated. The European Union is trying today. What do you think is going to happen? Still today they're trying to unify Europe and they still do not read, they shall not cleave. Daniel 2 verse 44 says, In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the rock that was cut out not by human hands. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain, not by human hands, a rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, and the silver and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true and the interpretation is trustworthy. So Daniel, who's given himself over to the risk, if you like, of telling the king what this vision is all about, this dream he's had, explains that from the head of gold right through to the toes and to the kingdom. We're starting at 606 B3 and going through to the end of time. But the rock hits where? It hits the toes. Where are we today in the stream of time according to the statue? Are we still with the Medes and the Persians? Have we seen Greece come and go? Have we seen the Roman Empire come and go? Have we seen the ten kingdoms? Have we seen the divided Europe? We are in the finger or in the toenails of the statue. And where does the rock hit? It hits the feet. Jesus is coming to fulfill his kingdom, to destroy the kingdoms that have been built up on this earth. 
Revelation 11.15 says, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord, and He shall reign forever and ever. Not a united Europe, not a united nations, not a united Africa. He shall reign forever and ever. Prophecy is a profound way to prove to us that no matter what happens in these cataclysmic events that are about to take place on this earth, God is in control. With this revelation, the King Nebuchadnezzar probably sits down in, in shock and awe. And in Daniel 2 verse 47, he says, Truly, your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings, and the revealer of secrets. From the head of gold, which was Babylon, to Persia, the chest and arms of silver, to Greece, the thighs of bronze, to Rome, the legs of iron, into the toes of the divided ten kingdoms of Rome, into the, the sectionalized and split up weak and strong sections of Europe today. It spans the history from the 606 BC right into eternity. We are busy covering the structure of prophecy at the moment. We've looked at symbols and we are in the middle of recapitulation. Join me for part two where the Lord will do, add new information as he recaps Daniel 2 as we go into the rest of Daniel in different depictions of the same information as he gives us more about the end time. Thank you.